You're listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, Holland and Knight's overarching public policy and regulation podcast series. Our public policy and regulation group has an ideal combination of lawyers and lobbyists with a comprehensive understanding of the federal policy and regulatory process. This series will shine a light on the shifting dynamics of governmental entities and the ensuing changes in economic or political policies, laws, and regulations that can have a critical impact on the health and future of your business. Hello, everyone. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here to talk about challenges in the infrastructure initiatives. Uh, This is the second of two podcasts where we have focused on the infrastructure plans that are being debated uh, over the last several weeks and going forward. Joining me today is Vanessa Shira. Vanessa is the Vice President of Trade and International Competitiveness at the American Clean Power Association, ACP, a multi-technology renewable energy industry trade group. Uh, ACP represents solar, storage, wind, and transmission companies, along with manufacturers and construction companies, developers and and owners, operators, utilities, financial firms, and corporate purchasers of the clean clean energy value chain. Boy, Vanessa, that's a a mouthful. Also joining us is my law partner, uh, Nassim Fassell. Nassim works at the intersection of international trade and public policy to help clients navigate the regulatory and legislative landscape in Washington, D.C. During our first podcast, we talked about the various infrastructure plans that are being debated. We talked about broad issues that are kind of defining the debate. One is the definition of what is infrastructure. Republicans and some conservative Democrats view the proper definition as that of more traditional things in infrastructure like bridges and roads. Uh, The Biden administration and progressive Democrats tend to view infrastructure in much broader terms, including clean power, uh, human infrastructure like child and elder care. And and finally, another issue uh, focusing the debate is how this is going to be paid. And we discussed that as well in the first podcast. So today we want to talk about challenges that are posed to industries uh, that want to move forward and take advantage of uh, an infrastructure package that gets passed. Um, And to do that, I want to first turn uh, to Vanessa, who will talk to us about these challenges through the eyes of the clean power industry. Uh, Vanessa, take it away. Thanks, Francisco. So uh, welcome back to the listeners. And um, I want you to engage in a visual exercise. I want you to stand in front of the U.S. Capitol and then turn around and walk to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House, because on the challenges side, we are talking about largely engaging with the executive branch on issues which were either created by the former president or, or are being created by this administration. Um, There are three reasons why I think clean energy is facing numerous headwinds on the, in the challenging uh, category in the coming months and years. Um, The first is frankly the legacy of the Trump administration, which was a large number of tariffs that were put onto US imports by the administration and are in many ways proving to be a drag on growth in the clean energy industry. And I will uh, will elaborate that on that in a minute. The second uh, trend here is the need for the Biden administration to do a balancing. And the balancing is between their stated goals of being American worker-centric policy builders um, and having a building back better uh, US manufacturing base while also supporting rapid deployment of clean energy capacity, which will inevitably include some reliance on imports. So that's sort of the second trend. And the third trend is really a further complication because of the position of uh, the US administration on China, which is uh, not unique to the Biden administration. There were concerns about China uh, dating back to the Obama administration. And certainly the Trump administration had grave concerns about uh, Chinese government practices and the Biden administration does as well. Basically what that means is the executive branch is increasingly hawkish, leading to debate about whether we should decouple from China, whether we should engage in a robust sort of strategic competitive partnership, how we should stay competitive when it's clear that the Chinese um, economic machine is something that is a hegemonic competitor to the US economy. So those three trends are creating a tension 
very much notable in the administration that results in a hesitation to remove tariffs, many of which are directly impacting clean energy. And I'm gonna talk in the rest of my time primarily about tariff policy. Tariffs are defined by US statutes. They're actually uh, congressionally uh, created. The, the con Congress has the right to in, uh, impose tariffs, which are basically taxes on imports. Most of that authority has been delegated uh, over this past, over the, during the 20th century to the, to the executive branch because it's very detailed work. And the programs are referred to by section numbers, meaning a section of a statute. So I'm gonna to refer to some of the policies by their statutory names. The first that I'm gonna talk about is they're called section 201 tariffs. So section 201 is a method for a domestic industry to claim tariff protection when it is being subjected to a surge of imports creating certain conjurious results in the domestic industry. And we had a situation where such tariffs were put on, at the request of US businesses, were put on certain solar cells and module imports by the Trump administration. They have, under this particular statute, there's a four year life to those tariffs and the fourth year anniversary will be next February. But if the domestic parties want four more years of protection, they have to seek an extension of that program. They have a limited time to do that. And that deadline is actually August 7th of this year. If the domestic manufacturers make a request like that, there will be a process involving a government agency called the International Trade Commission. It is a public process and you are available to watch it. Um, it will be virtual, by the way. But there are, it's a public hearing and there are filing of public documents. And then uh, the commission makes a recommendation to the president. Now, to be clear, under the statute, this particular set of tariffs is uh, the decision of the president. And so uh, the president will likely have to make some sort of decision on this program later in the year, but his deadline would be February because that's when the current set of tariffs expires. Just to be very clear with everyone, my uh, ACP's goal is to strenu strenuously oppose the tariff extension. We feel that the tariffs have not uh, necessarily done what they were meant to do. And in fact, have served as, as a tremendous problem for clean energy deployment. And if extended, we are concerned that four more years of tariffs, uh, and these are on global imports of solar cells and panels, would be devastating to deployment and the deployment targets that the Biden administration is, is setting for solar projects. So that whole process will play itself out over the summer and fall of this year. But that's the first set of tariffs that will either get renewed or will, will, will extinguish next February. A second set of tariffs are called Section 232 tariffs. And those were instituted by the Trump administration on global steel and aluminum products with a rationale that those US industries needed protection from imports. And the specific provision of the statute refers to something known as national security. National security in Washington means whatever you say it means. It's, uh, it's not a well-defined term in statute, but generally speaking, it basically means that the decision maker believes that there needs to be some sort of domestic production of those commodities, particularly with respect to wartime readiness or other military needs. The results of these tariffs have been, I would argue, very counterproductive. As a result of the tariffs, we've seen very high metal commodity prices in the steel and aluminum markets with very little increased investment or modernization by US industry players. Uh, meanwhile, there has been a large and negative impact on metal users in many sectors. And if you think about the way metal is used in manufacture, you will realize that that includes all sorts of autos and RVs and trailers, in addition to construction materials and for my purposes, clean energy products. So removal uh, of these tariffs is a high priority for us. It'll be difficult, frankly, due to the political power of parties that are affected on the beneficial side by the tariffs. But the process is looks like it's being started by the administration on its return from Europe. Last week did say that they were talking with the European Union about some sort of removal of those tariffs on products being exported from Europe. So that will be interesting to see how that particular set of tariffs are dealt with by the administration. And then there's a third set of tariffs with another number, Section 301 tariffs. So these, air, these tariffs were put on Chinese imports, a large range of Chinese imports, after an administration investigation concluded that China was engaging in unfair practices regarding intellectual property and technology transfer. The resulting tariffs range from 25% to 7.5%, but they cover $350 billion of exports that leave, the China, leave China for the United States. So it's, it's a large part of our trade with China, at least 
the trade as it was in the middle of the administration. So given the current administration's posture toward China, we think it's unlikely that those tariffs will be removed anytime soon. And frankly, there's a reason for that, which is that they provide leverage in discussions with the Chinese over economic policy. And you know, we are not arguing that, that there aren't reasons to have those tariffs and have that sort of discussion with the Chinese. What we would like to see is a new process, which did exist under the Trump administration, but has since finished, uh, for seeking an exclusion from certain tariffs, uh, particularly related to clean energy products. So examples would be in the wind turbine business, there are certain gearboxes and large castings that are simply not made in the United States. We don't have a supply chain for those, and those would be uh, in many cases imported from China. And in the solar space, things like inverters and junction boxes, again, uh, would, would be something that we would want an exclusion from the tariffs for. So this is some way that you can maintain the ch Chinese tariffs broadly, but grant limited exclusions when you have a lack of a supply chain, which hasn't been built up yet outside of China. And we would argue that uh, if you don't grant those exclusions, you're going to have some clean energy delay because people aren't going to be able to get some of those inputs that they need to produce these large scale wind projects and solar projects. And lastly, I'm just going to touch on an area that's not really tariffs, but it does affect trade and it is an important discussion. So many of you may have read in the paper, it's been highly publicized recently that the Chinese have engaged in a very unpleasant forced labor situation in Xinjiang province in China. This is largely targeted at Uyghurs who are an ethnic minority in Western China. And there are very credible allegations from many, many sources that the Uyghurs are being put into detention camps and basically being forced to work in industry under what the world would con conclude to be a forced labor condition. And the U.S. has a very strict policy of not allowing imported products which are produced with forced labor under a, another federal statute. So this is an area where the government is under a lot of pressure to figure out how to, to prevent those products from entering the United States. On the clean energy side, we've been working very, very hard with our companies to make sure that our companies are not importing or using any products that are made in that province by nature of this type of forced labor work. And the issue is going to be how to figure out which products fall in the category of sort of clean imports, meaning imports that are that are not tainted by a supply chain that has this forced labor in it. We're working really hard to make sure that happens, but we are also very concerned that the rest of the world needs to be worried about this. And I think that the administration is trying to convey that message to our trading partners in some cases with mixed results because some of our trading partners feel very concerned about criticizing the Chinese for reasons that have to do with economic reliance. So we are, uh, again, I didn't want to leave that not mentioned because it's coming up a lot in the press and it's, it, it, it's, it's a topic that the solar industry takes very seriously. And if you are more interested in that, I'm happy to follow up with people if they have more questions about that. But I'm going to stop, turn it back to Francisco. Well, thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, Nassim, would you care to comment on Vanessa's observations? Yes, thank you, Vanessa, uh, for uh, you know very uh, thorough overview of some of the challenges that that the industry is facing today. And I'd like to add a few additional details to some of Vanessa's comments on challenges that the industry is currently facing. In her discussion on tariffs, Vanessa indicated that the companies would like to see the resumption of a Section 301 product exclusion process. The good news is that it's not just importers that would like to see this happen. Now, there was definitely an attempt by the Senate recently to, to do that on Section 301 in the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, which passed the Senate on June 8th. There was language inserted through an amendment by Senators Crapo and Wyden, uh, the leaders of the Senate Finance Committee, to um, include an exclusion process within USTR for the China 301 tariffs. But the process for that remains very unclear in the House of Representatives for the time being. So we'll see where all of this goes. I mean, on, on the part of USTR, uh, Ambassador Tai has said that she is going to conduct uh, a top to bottom China review and um, that any consideration of reinstituting an exclusion process will be a part of that. But I think the Senate made very clear that there's a lot of eagerness and interest in, in doing that sooner than later. And despite the uncertainty on the House side in terms of legislation, members of the House have made clear that they want to see the process resume as well. 
In late April, over 100 Republicans and Democrats in the House sent a letter to Ambassador Tai urging her to reestablish an exclusion process. And there have been numerous conversations with her since then, um, including uh, most recently in a conversation that the House New Democrat Coalition had with Ambassador Tai. So there's a lot of interest here, and it's something that I think everybody is watching closely, both uh, on the Hill and, and in the importer community to see if uh, you know, this process can get started. On the tariff front, there are a number of other challenges as well. And you know, some of that, I guess, just focusing on legislation involves the expiration of various trade programs, um, all of which at the end of the day, when expired amount to cost, um, not just uh, for Vanessa's industry, but many, many others as well. For example, uh, on December 31st of 2020, uh, the miscellaneous tariff bill and the generalized system of preferences both expired. Um, these are two trade programs. One is a, a tariff trade preferential treatment program and another one is a program that provides a temporary a tariff suspension uh, or reduction for inputs used for uh, US manufacturing of products that are then exported. Uh, both of these expired at the end of 2020. Uh, it's not unprecedented for these programs to expire with a little bit of a lapse, but we are now heading into uh, uh, almost eight months of lapse and you know the costs uh, are racking up and, and importers are, are really eager to see these programs renewed. The Senate, as part of its China package, also included MTB and GSP renewals. Um, but unfortunately, the House and Senate are not aligned here on, on what's going on and what to do next. Uh, House Democrats um, have introduced their own version of renewal for both programs. Um, House Republicans have, have introduced their own separate bill and, and seem to be working in good alignment with the Senate um, and what the future holds uh, is unclear at the moment. On top of that, um, Trade Promotion Authority expired at the end of June. So, uh, you know, the, what that tells us is that there are, there are definitely no new comprehensive free trade agreements. On, on the horizon. And so, you know, uh, the combination of expired programs, um, additional tariffs, this all, you know, further complicates the tariff outlook uh, and, and just makes a long list of challenges uh, for, from a tariff standpoint. Now, switching gears for a moment, I'd like to touch briefly on what Vanessa described as uh, the Biden administration balancing between a worker-centric trade policy and building back better and supporting rapid deployment of clean energy capacity. The challenge here lies in threading this needle in a way that strengthens workers and furthers the administration's agenda without making trade a bad word. Um, you know, trade has always been a difficult issue uh, politically, um, but you know, the benefits, as Vanessa, uh, you know, laid out are, are important. And when there are challenges, such as the ones she has described, um, you know, politically and from a policy standpoint, um, it, it just becomes more and more difficult, I think, to find a clear path uh, for, for solutions. We're going to have to find a way, though, to thread this needle uh, that, as I said, doesn't make trade a bad word. And, and what I mean there is that we have to be able to demonstrate the benefits and be able to move forward and help companies and entire industries realize those benefits without making it seem as though um, that is in some way harmful across the board. Um, you know, one area, just to provide an example, um, where this seems to be coming up a lot besides tariffs is um, Buy American and, and domestic preference programs. President Biden said in his State of the Union address earlier this year that all investments in the American Jobs Plan will be guided by one principle, Buy American. And yet he said that this would not violate any trade agreements that the United States has. So clearly the administration is aware of concerns of many of our allies and even US businesses about 
the continuation or proliferation of protectionist trade policies. But they're also trying <laughs> to further this uh, domestically focused agenda and, you know, as Vanessa characterized it, you know, this, um, this domestic building back better, supporting the rapid deployment of U.S. manufacturing, but at the same time trying to support uh, rapid deployment of clean energy capacity, which, you know, I think if you ask anyone in the industry, um, they'll say that that, that that will require, at least in uh, the immediate term, some reliance uh, on trade, uh, it's, you know, and not just this industry. So we'll see where this heads, but hopefully any new Buy America policies, Buy America, Buy American domestic preference requirements, any such policies that are incorporated in uh, the new legislation to further U.S. infrastructure will exclude procurement covered by trade agreements, um, just as in the 2010 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, but even then, I think there were some challenges and we're likely to hit a few bumps in the road here. But as this legislation is coming together, I think uh, particularly in, in, in this next week, it's an opportunity for um, uh, you know, stakeholders to, to weigh in. Uh, with the Hill and, and allies to weigh in with the Hill to, uh, you know, explain what, what challenges this, this would raise if, if we have too many uh, requirements uh, along the lines of domestic preference requirements by America and by America in our infrastructure package. The bottom line is that protectionism, uh, particularly here in the context of an infrastructure package, will in the long run definitely benefit a small number of businesses and industries, but to the detriment of many others, while also deteriorating US trade relations. So again, I think this is a really, really critical threading of the needle that needs to occur here so that we can make sure that, that we really have a robust program. And finally, a few quick points to tie this all together. What I'm hearing from Vanessa is that the US clean power industry wants to contribute to the modernization of US infrastructure and wants to help the United States be more competitive with China. However, this will be hard to do with one hand tied behind its back, whether it's legacy trade irritants, such as section 201, 232 or 301 tariffs or new domestic preference requirements and um, government involvement in supply chains the vast majority of US industries will only be able to do so much with protectionist trade policies hindering full potential. So, uh, you know, hopefully in, in these coming months and years, we will see some, um, some policies develop that take account of all of this and, and we'll be able to make some uh, headway uh, in, in, in developing um, in a very strong way, the US clean power industry. And with that, uh, I will hand it back to Francisco. Thank you, Nassim. And I'll say that you and Vanessa tackled a review of the challenges as Congress and the administration looked to pass an infrastructure bill. You did a great job of identifying the challenges that we should keep an eye out for. Uh, and to our audience, let me remind you that Nassim and I and our colleagues at Holland and Knight are closely monitoring uh, the infrastructure debate. If you have any questions or if we can help you in any way regarding this and, and other public policy issues, please reach out to us. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to Nassim and Vanessa. Thank you for listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, brought to you by Holland and Knight's Public Policy and Regulation Group. For more information on our public policy and regulation group, please visit hklaw.com slash PPR.